So uh, welcome everybody to the Managing Diabetes in Ramadan um, uh, webinar. I'm Bilal Lone. I'm a family physician and sports medicine physician working in Hamilton, Ontario. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Michelle mcdonald Wurstak. I'm a dietitian and a nutrition coordinator here at the Hamilton Family Health Team. So today, um, this presentation is brought to you by the Hamilton Family Health Team and the Muslim Medical Association of Canada. Um, so we'll just talk about um, you know, what, what diabetes is, um, how it changes things for Ramadan, uh, for fasting, and uh, we'll just go through some things that uh, you can do to more safely uh, manage your diabetes during Ramadan. Uh, next slide. Yes, and if you have any questions, uh, feel free to put it in the chat box if you'd like, and we'll try to address that as we go through. For sure. So conflict of interest, really, the only thing is I'm a board member of the Muslim Medical Association of Canada. Uh, next slide. So after attending the webinar today, hopefully you will understand the importance of Ramadan as a time of spiritual growth in the Muslim community, uh, be able to identify how to fast safely during Ramadan and why it's important to meet your doctor ahead of time and your healthcare team ahead of time to plan for Ramadan, um, be able to answer the questions such as what can you do to prevent low blood sugars during fasting hours, um, healthy foods you can eat for iftar and suhoor, um, how to prevent constipation, dehydration, um, and hopefully minimize weight gain during Ramadan. Uh, next slide. So just a quick overview, very high level. What is diabetes? Basically diabetes, the word uh, lends itself to basically high blood sugar levels over a long period of time. And this can be due to type one diabetes where your body's pancreas is not producing enough insulin, or it can develop later on in life, like type two diabetes, um, where you're not responding to the insulin that your body's producing. And so insulin's like the key to the lock. It helps um, sh sugars get from your bloodstream into the cells in your body and your muscles and be used. Uh, next slide. So diabetes in Ramadan. Again, it's very important to discuss with your doctor if you're planning to fast for Ramadan, um, especially if you have diabetes. Um, it may or may not be recommended depending on the medications you're on, depending on your level of uh, blood sugar level control. Um, and even if you are able to, um, you may require changes to your medications. Uh, next slide. So my interest in this topic really is from my own personal um, family uh, dealing with this. Uh, so my mom was diagnosed with diabetes when I was in undergrad, uh, just before med school. Um, she was advised to stop, uh, sorry, not fast um, when she had diabetes. Um, and, you know, I was able to find some research about this. Uh, we spoke to the doctor and, you know, she's been able to fast every year since then. Uh, next slide. So just a brief overview of um, who fasts. So obviously we're talking today about uh, fasting in the context of Ramadan uh, for uh, Muslims. Um, it's the fourth pillar of Islam, it involves complete abstinence from food, drink, um, smoking, oral intake. But in other cultures and other religions, we have uh, fasting as well. So in Judaism um, for Yom Kippur, um, it's complete abstinence from food and drink for about 25 hours um, from about sunset on the evening before to about an hour after sunset the next evening. Um, in Christianity, uh, certain denominations have various types of fasting. The common theme amongst all of these at the end of the day is, you know, you're abstaining from specific foods, drink, um, uh, any uh, intake, and you're doing it for spiritual reasons to get closer to uh, your faith, to you, to um, to God, um, but the common theme really at the end of the day is that the sanctity of life principle applies, right? So if it's gonna harm your body, if it's gonna hurt you, um, there's exemptions for people for fasting, uh, um, if doing so will uh, make you ill. Uh, next slide, please. So we'll talk about Ramadan in a bit more detail. Um, so fasting in the context of Ramadan it involves abstaining from all food, drink, smoking, oral medications from sunrise to sunset. Um, there are exemptions, obviously, for uh, children below the age of puberty, uh, people with acute illnesses, travelers, uh, women who are menstruating, pregnant, uh, nursing. And, you know, in the Quran, it does say... Um, uh, on the side here, I've listed it. Um, you know, fasting is prescribed to you, but if any of you is ill or traveling, you're exempt from fasting. Um, so, you know, we'll get into a little bit about why it matters. Um, uh, can we go to the next slide, please? So, when it comes to 
the Canadian context of this? Why does it matter? So it, in 2011, uh, there was about 1.1 million Muslim Canadians. It's probably a lot larger now with uh, immigration over the years. Um, and the, the key point here is the, the study done in 2004 that showed that, you know, 43% of type 1 diabetes patients and about 80% of people with type 2 diabetes um, fasted for at least 15 days uh, during Ramadan. And less than half of those people changed their medications prior to Ramadan. And so that's very important because it can cause problems with, um, uh, you know, it, it can be life-threatening if you if you get low blood sugar levels, if you're dehydrated, you can end up hospitalized. Um, so it's really important to talk to your healthcare team about how to fast um, when it comes to Ramadan. Uh, next slide. So really when it comes to Ramadan with diabetes, education is key, right? So you wanna be able to recognize, you know, what are the emergencies? What are the reasons that I would stop fasting? Um, you know, what is, a low blood sugar level? How do I recognize it? And what do I need to do if that happens? Uh, or the converse, if it's my sugar is too high, what do I need to do? Um, you know, it's important to know how to plan your meals, uh, especially this year with fasting being about 14 to 15 hours, depending on where you are, um, you know, how to avoid low blood sugar levels, avoid getting dehydrated, um, and what kind of foods to choose um, at your meal times and timing and intensity of physical activity. Um, uh, next slide. And if you actually look, this has been shown in the research, those who actually um, have educated edu education before Ramadan um, have a reduction in the rate of complications. They lose weight actually instead of gaining weight. Um, so it's important to talk to your doctor anywhere from one to three months. I know we're only about a week and a half out now, but um, one to three months uh, prior to Ramadan, talk to your doctor, talk to them about, is it safe for me to fast? What complications might arise and what happens if those complications arise, what should I do? Um, you know, do I need to change, make any changes to my medications? Um, how should I structure my eating patterns um, and exercise? Like, is it recommended? What can I do, et cetera? So we'll just talk about each of these things a little bit more detail. Uh, next slide. Oh, I already said all, <laughs> sorry. So you want to talk about the safety of fasting, uh, the risks associated, and then very important is when to break the fast and discontinue fasting if needed. Uh, next slide. So the patient with diabetes who is safe to fast, ideally, um, you know, they have a well-controlled um, glycemic control. So their um, diabetes is very well controlled. They're otherwise pretty healthy and they have low risks of hypoglycemia, so low, low blood sugar level. So this means you're at low risk due to your job. You're at low risk uh, due to the medications you're on and other reasons. Uh, next slide. Uh, perfect. So when should you break your fast? So one of the most common things that may happen, especially this was more pertinent when Ramadan was in the summer months, but I mean, obviously now as well, uh, dehydration. So if you get dehydrated, um, you might feel, uh, you might feel weak. You might feel especially thirsty. You might feel, um, you know, you're not being enough lightheaded, lots of balance. These are all signs of, um, dehydration. You should break your fast, uh, drink water, add in some kind of salt or sugar solution, like taking like a fruit juice or um, a sports drink like Gatorade um, you can take and you should hold uh, your um, medications that you take by mouth that day, such as metformin and some of the other medications um, because you should not be on those medications if you're not getting enough fluids in your body. Um, so the next thing would be hypoglycemia. So this is, this is what we call a low blood sugar level. So when your sugar is below four, um, and you know, you're symptomatic and we'll talk about the symptoms, uh, but you know, you might feel, uh, some, some of the similar symptoms as dehydration, you might feel that your heart's racing, uh, you feel thirsty, um, you feel anxious. Um, so again, very important, check your sugar, break the fast with a small amount of, uh, any kind of sugary thing, right? So it can be apple juice, it can be a date, it can be honey, retest your sugar again, 15 to 20 minutes later, and then repeat it until your blood sugar levels over four. And then you can make up the fast at a later date. And then lastly, hyperglycemia. This often is caused by taking in too much food at meal times, right? So this is when your sugar level goes above 16, it says 14 here, but um, 
you know, it's it's anywhere like in the double digits, 14 to 16, you start feeling um, you're, you're peeing more, you're thirsty, you're hungry, um, you just feel unwell. You might, feel, some people in extreme cases can go into a coma. Um, so this would be a reason to stop your fast, go to the hospital immediately. If you have type one diabetes, make sure you check your ketones as well. Um, and make sure you take a dose of uh, fast acting insulin. And then if this happens, if your blood sugar levels go too high and you experience symptoms and you need to go to the hospital, you should really reevaluate if you're safe to continue fasting for Ramadan or not. Uh, and very important, if you're sick, if you have uh, diarrhea, you're vomiting, you're nauseous, uh, you're not feeling well, um, the risk of emergencies is higher on those days because you're likely not going to be eating and drinking as well uh, um, around your mealtimes. So make sure uh, you don't fast on those days and make it up at a later date. Uh, next slide. Symptoms of hypoglycemia. So these are some of the things. If you've ever had a low blood sugar level, you're very familiar with this. It's not comfortable. Um, you feel blurry vision. You feel hunger. Um, the biggest things I find people complain of is the fast heartbeat. You're shaking. You're dizzy. You just feel very weak and lethargic. Um, so again, if this happens during Ramadan, make sure you check your sugar levels and treat it immediately. Break your fast and um, make sure you check your sugar again to make sure it comes up. Uh, next slide. This one's a little bit hard to eat, uh, read, sorry, not eat. I just read the word eat, but, um, so with low blood sugar levels, um, again, you want to take something that's sugary. So whether it's like a piece of, uh, candy or, um, orange juice is something that's commonly used. And then you want to wait 15 minutes afterwards, check again, make sure it's above four. And uh, a lot of times what happens is people will, eat everything in sight and just keep going, um, you know, within five minutes and then don't wait that 15 minute period. And then their sugars are then too high. They like hit 20 um, from a low. So just make sure you're, you're giving it time to work. Uh, next slide. So if you're sick during Ramadan, so again, like I said, vomiting, diarrhea, you're lightheaded, break your fast immediately, go to the doctor or ER, uh, sorry, emergency room, um, seek medical attention, um, and continue uh, monitoring your blood glucose. Uh, next slide. So when it comes to glucose testing, there's this, there's these myths that, well, if, if you check your sugars, your fast will not count. And that's false. Skin pricking or checking your sugars with a glucometer um, does not invalidate your fast. So please make sure you're checking your sugars, especially if you're feeling unwell. Um, number two, if you keep checking your blood sugar level, the ch ch chances of your fast breaking increases. So you just don't want to check. And that's very problematic because like I said earlier, right? Hypoglycemia. So when your blood sugar level goes low can be life-threatening, especially when you're elderly, it can also, there's research that shows it can cause, um, cognitive changes like, um, related to the brain. So although frequent checks, um, Sure, they might increase your chance of breaking your fast if you're checking and you notice it's low. Um, but again, harming your body in the process of fasting is, is forbidden, it's discouraged. And so at the end of the day, it's important to make sure that you're, you're keeping yourself safe, you're keeping your body safe um, and fasting safely. So please be sure to check, especially if you're feeling sick. Uh, next slide. So how often should I test? Um, it really depends on the type of diabetes. It depends on the individual. It depends on your risk factors. Type 1 diabetes patients or type 2 diabetes patients who are on insulin uh, will need to test more frequently just because being on insulin um, or any medication that increases your body's production of insulin um, will make you more prone to having a low blood sugar level. So you want to make sure you're checking regularly, um, depending on the literature, it says anywhere from two to four hours while you're uh, fasting. Uh, you want to make sure you, at least you check in the morning and after after your meal, uh, iftar meal as well. Um, if you're on medications but not on insulin and you have type 2 diabetes, um, you know, at minimum, you want to test when you wake up and at iftar time as well. Uh, next slide. So testing your blood sugar levels at home. So typically we, before meals, expect your sugars to be between four and seven. Um, and then after meals, uh, you know, five to 10. And ideally you don't want it to go up by more than two from your pre-meal. So if, for example, your before meal was six, it ideally doesn't go more than eight 
um, after your meals, like two hours after your meals. Now you want to test to see the effects of what you're eating and um, what it does to your sugar levels. Um, the in Ramadan, these targets are relaxed a little bit. Um, generally, um, your your um, levels during fasting hours can range from five to ten. We don't want it to go above really, um, but some papers have even said you can go up to twelve. But ideally, five to ten is kind of where you want to keep it during your fi fasting hours. Um, and if it falls too quickly in the first few hours after suhoor, and you notice you're already down to like four point five and like an hour after like Fajr prayer, you know, it, it might be, you have to keep a close eye on it for the rest of the day to make sure it doesn't go too low. All right, uh, next slide. Michelle, I'll let you take over. Okay, um, so here we have a question for you um, asking what is the following is sound dietary advice for people with diabetes during Ramadan? Is it A, avoid overconsumption at meals, aiming for balanced meals with low glycemic carbohydrates? Is it B, eat unlimited amounts of sugary and deep fried foods? Is it C, avoid caffeinated beverages and ensure adequate fluid intake? So if you answer D, both A and C, you actually are correct. So we wanted to talk a little bit about preventing weight gain during Ramadan. So as a dietitian, this is what I see often. Many patients are coming to me because this seems to be the concern for them. Not so much hypoglycemia, but that does happen in some situations as well. So we do start to talk about Ramadan as a very special time. And it really is a month long celebration with special meals. And we all know special meals can come sometimes with added sugars, with more fats, they can be deep fried, they can be larger volumes perhaps than we normally might eat. And so this can be a common result if we're over consuming at certain meals or the foods that are richer foods than we normally consume, you may see a high post meal blood sugar. And as Dr. Lone mentioned, if you go higher than two or three points after a meal, that's telling you that 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 particular meal is challenging the insulin in your body to manage it well. So we do actually encourage people to do some testing pre post meal, so pre dawn meal and and post dusk meal to see how their body is actually handling some of those different meals. So when we're talking about the pre-dawn meal, this is where, again, it can be quite early in the morning, it can be 3, 4, 5 a.m. sometimes, and it's hard for people to get this meal in. I've had several people over the past few weeks that really, they're trying to catch the last second of sleep, so it's really hard to get this meal in, but we have these conversations about it's so important to fuel your body and your brain before dawn so that you can give some energy to the brain uh, for at least four or five hours because it's a very long fast if you tend to skip this meal. And I, I have talked to a couple of people where they are skipping this meal in an attempt to see weight loss. And so we've had a lot of discussions about the importance of this Sahur meal. So at this meal, you're really trying to pick foods that give you sustained energy. So you're trying to go for those meals that are balanced, that will give you fuel for at least four to five hours. And typically a meal will um, raise your sugar within two hours, and then that sugar starts to come down within three to four hours. So again, we're trying to maximize that as much, particularly at this time where there's a 14, 15 hour fast. So here's a few examples of some balanced Sahur meals that will really maximize your energy during the day. You'll notice all of them are quite high in fiber. So things like the oatmeal, the type of bread you choose, um, the, the fruits and vegetables you add, these are all sources of fiber you can add to a meal, um, as well as the protein sources. So you're seeing eggs for protein, nuts and seeds for protein. Again, we really want that protein to help with appetite control as well, because that does give you more feeling of fullness for several hours. The fiber will also help give that feeling of fullness because it slows down how food is actually leaving the stomach. So coming up with meals that you and your family like um, that are quick and easy, because again, I know people are trying to get as much rest as they can, um, is really important that we start your day off with some fuel so that you can try to go safely through that very extended fasting period. The other important piece is hydration. And um, of course, hydration, there's all different sources of fluids we can consume. We're trying to be very mindful though of some of the fluids that come with added sugars. So you'll see by the teaspoons of added sugars here, 
Some drinks are six to 10 teaspoons in one beverage. And so that can really cause a high post meal effect because again, these sugars are quite rapidly absorbed. They tend to increase in the bloodstream quite quickly. The liver grabs them and often converts them to triglycerides very quickly. So again, that, that uh, link with fatty liver can happen as well if there's a high consumption of sweet drinks. So we do encourage you to have things like water um, and be mindful of some of the types of liquids you're consuming. When it comes to the end of the day and, and dusk has come and you're now, now ready for the sunset meal, um, this is where you want to break the fast with, with meals that you and your family enjoy. So traditionally in Ramadan, there is um, the idea of starting with dates and dates and milk type of thing to break the fast, um, but then having a nice, lovely balanced meal with the family. We want to make sure again at that meal that there's not overconsumption because that's quite hard to not overconsume after a day of fasting, right? Particularly in Canada where our work schedules are not modified for Ramadan. And so you're working often all day or going to school all day. Um, and so really um, you want to replenish the body after the at sunset and you want to make sure it has those nutrients that you need that will give you that sustained energy um, and sort of replenish what you need in the day. We also, again, special meals, special celebrations. We do find foods tend to be richer. Again, deep fried foods. We know fat can re, um, enhance insulin resistance. So the muscles may not be as receptive to pulling in the sugars. And so some of the meals uh, listed here may be meals we enjoy, but definitely can have an impact on post-meal blood sugar, as well as some of the sweeter, sweeter additions to the meals. And so when it comes to planning and plate, for healthy eating for anyone at any time, we're really trying to use this concept that we've used for many years in diabetes. And some of you may even recognize this idea of a quarter of your plate protein, another quarter of your plate is your whole grain and half your plate is vegetable choice. So Canada's Food Guide has now adopted this balanced style of eating as well. And that's what this picture is, is from. But it's that idea of really trying to fill your plate with a lot of vegetables because we don't count the carbs and vegetables anymore, except for potato and corn. Um, of course, we want that protein because protein is important not only for lean muscle mass, but for making those brain neurotransmitters, so for mood regulation. And we'd like a nice variety of protein from animal protein to um, plant sources of protein as well. And of course, when it comes to your grain choice, that's where you're trying to pick a very slow digesting, high fiber grain choice that's going to absorb quite slow and give you a good post-meal blood sugar effect. So one of the questions I always talk to, to patients about is carbohydrates and how much carbohydrate do they think they need at a meal? And that's where we're all very different. Um, each of us will metabolize foods differently. And that's the, the reason we ask for pre and post meal testing is it really helps you see how much carbohydrate can you manage well after a meal. Now in our diabetes guidelines, they recommend for females about, oops, for females about 40 to 60 grams of carbohydrate per meal. So three or four carb choices at each meal. And if you love numbers, each carb choice is about 15 grams of carbohydrate. For men, the recommendations are usually 60 to 75 grams of carbohydrate per meal. And this is just an example of a meal that has a fruit choice. It has some citrus there. It has a pasta choice. It has a milk choice. So you're looking at about three to four carb choices there. So that type of meal in the picture would be about 45 to 60 grams of carbohydrate at a meal. Now, I thought it would be a good idea to compare carbohydrate content because this is where sometimes it gets quite confusing for people because they're eating very healthy meals, but perhaps the carbohydrate amount is more than what their insulin in their body can handle well. So again, if you're comparing these two meals, uh, one on the left is a, a balanced meal that has a bit of fruit. You can see it in the corner there. It has some potato and it has a glass of milk. So it has about three carb choices, about 45 grams of carb. Generally, again, as we mentioned, most people with diabetes can handle that 45 to 60 grams of carbohydrate quite well. Again, that's for type 2 diabetes. On the right, there's a, a picture of a traditional Ramadan plate, which again is a very balanced meal. But when we start to look at the amount of carbohydrate, it can add up to quite a bit. So when we look at the whole grain rice, while the rice is a very good choice, it's high fiber, it's whole grain, it's going to absorb slower than, say, perhaps white rice might, a cup and a half of rice is equal to about three 
carb choices. So that's about 45 grams of carb right there. Then when you add the fruits in this particular meal, of course, they've included dates and they've included watermelon as well. With two fruit choices, each fruit choice is about 15 grams of carb. So there's another 30 grams of carbohydrate there. And then of course the milk is another 15. So this meal, again, depending on the type of rice chosen, can be well over 100 grams of carbohydrate. And that's where you'd want to test two hours after this meal, before and two hours after, to see how you respond to this amount of carbohydrate. Does your sugar only go up one or two millimoles, which is perfectly normal, and then that tells you that meal was great? Or did it jump more than two, three, four, five, six millimoles, which tells you that despite being a very healthy meal, it really had a challenge on your insulin. Another tool you can use to help with your food choices, and many of you probably have heard about this, is called the glycemic index. And this is a tool from Diabetes Canada, and it basically ranks foods with sort of a traffic-like idea, green light, yellow light, red light, uh, of foods in comparison and how they affect the bloodstream in terms of blood sugar. So the foods on the green list, for example, the breads listed there, compared to the breads on the red list, the breads on the green will digest slower. They'll tend to take longer to break down, a slower rise, more sustainable rise in your blood sugar, um, and less of a peak on that blood sugar two hours after. The same with the different grains, for example, like you'll see that um, things like converted rice in the green list, parboiled converted, gives a much better post-meal reading compared to, say, white sticky rice. So again, this may be a tool that you find helpful um, in your food choices. I thought I would share with you just an example of a meal, and this came from another dietitian who specializes in Ramadan education. And this just shows perhaps some examples of, of healthy choices to have. Um, again, starting with the dates in the evening, and then followed by sunset prayer, and then the main meal with a balanced meal, with a protein choice, with a slow digesting grain choice, with those healthy fats from olive oil, or perhaps avocado, um, and then fruit for dessert, as well as fluid from water or soup. Many people often have a snack a few hours later, you know, fruit with yogurt perhaps, with water again to try to get the fluid in. And again, later in the evening, there may be another pre-bedtime snack as well. And then in the early morning or the pre-dawn, they've given an example here, of fava beans with eggs and an avocado, with sprouted green bread, Greek yogurt for dessert, and again, the one or two cups of water trying to get that in um, before you begin your fast for the day. So I thought I would give you an example of a patient I had met with, um, and this was a, a lady, Marina, who actually had diabetes for many years. She finds Ramadan is a very special time for herself and her family, and she always looks forward to it. But the past couple of years, though, she was reporting to me that she really struggled with high blood sugars after her meals, and she was giving some examples of typical meals she would have for iftar, and you can see that um, very similar to the traditional Ramadan plate, when she was eating those, that meal, despite having wonderfully healthy foods, her post-meal sugars were going up to 12. She was also noticing some weight gain because, again, that link between the high post-meal um, sugars and that conversion to fats that happens very quickly after that meal. So a couple of questions for you to think about, you know, is this number within target after a meal? As we talked about before, we try to keep it as close to five to 10 as if we can, two hours post-meal. Of course, everyone is an individual and we can tailor that according to each person. But again, because of heart health, we're always thinking about your heart as well as your blood sugars. We try to keep the sugars as close to those targets as we can. And people generally feel better. I do find a lot of patients report, you know, they're running to the bathroom a lot if sugars start to get into the 15s and 16s. A lot of people report headaches when sugars get that high too. So we want people to feel well because this again is a month long celebration. So of course, we talked about this already. Why do you think her sugars went high? It could have been the carbohydrate amount. Perhaps, you know, if she reduced it uh, to maybe one fruit choice to just the dates, perhaps if she reduces the rice amount, um, perhaps she didn't have a whole grain rice or she had a faster absorbing type of rice. So there's lots of ways we could play around with the type of rice, even how much you cook it. So if you um, cook rice to very, very soft, it can digest much quicker and raise your sugars much faster. If you do more of an al dente type of cooking, again, that can slow down the sugar effect. Adding a drizzle of olive oil into the rice after cooking, all of these are strategies that can really change the post-meal numbers. Again, so we don't want people to have to really change their meals completely. We just want to fine tune things a little bit for them. Okay, so 
questions we always get as dietitians, my sugars are high after suhur and iftar, what do I do? Again, this is where we often ask people to do some testing for us just for a couple of days, two or three days. And really we wanna see what are your meals that you're having? When are you having them? And what is the effect on your blood sugar? And then it's a question of if you're going high is do I need to adjust my meal choices? Are my portions larger? Could I modify the amounts of carbohydrate? Am I having a lot of deep fried foods that could be worsening the insulin resistance? Um, do I need to modify my rapid insulin to better match the carbohydrate intake at my meal? So again, there's lots we can help you with to really help make sure that you're getting the best possible sugars and, and you feel the best that you can. In terms of constipation, this comes up quite a few times too, right? Because there definitely is changes in fluid despite people trying to drink enough through the evening and, and early morning, sometimes uh, as Dr. Lowell mentioned, the urine does start to get a little bit concentrated. People start to get a little bit dehydrated, which is very linked with, with worsening the bowel constipation. And we know sometimes as we eat less, um, fewer meal periods in the day, less uh, food in the GI system, and that can slow it down a little bit too. And so, of course, when it comes to those meals, those, those pre-dawn and post-dusk meals, we really want to try to pack in as much fiber as we can, you know, things like vegetables with edible skins, fruits with skins, of course, legumes, peas, beans, lentils are all amazingly great foods for fiber and protein, nuts and seeds as well as, as the whole grains. Back over to you. Perfect. Thank you so much. That was really helpful, Michelle. Um, so we'll just quickly touch on exercise and medication. So exercise, it's still recommended to exercise uh, during Ramadan, uh, but timing and your you know awareness of uh, how you're feeling during exercise is important. Um, it's not time to take on a new exercise re regime or take on a rigorous exercise program. You know you just want to do enough to still stay active and keep in mind that you know your prayers like going to tarawih and going to the masjid or doing your prayers at home um, also contribute uh, and count as exercise. Um, you know doing your chores around the the house also count as exercise. Uh, next slide. So performing regular, light, moderate activity, um, a light walk, um, or like I said, some of the activities that you do during Ramadan anyways, for about 15 to 30 minutes every day um, is advisable. You know, you don't want to do um, high intensity exercise during the daytime, during fasting, especially if you're fasting with diabetes. Um, you know, ideally you do it just after iftar, uh, sorry, just before iftar, like in the immediate, like half hour before, um, or even better would be two to three hours after, um, you know, try not to do it like middle of the day. Um, and if you are doing uh, any kind of physical activity, you experience dizziness, nausea, uh, difficulties breathing or chest pain, um, please stop immediately and seek medical attention. Um, you know, make sure you're drinking enough water um, or fluids in general between iftar and suhoor, uh, so you're not getting dehydrated uh, during fasting. Um, very important to do. Uh, next slide. So we'll briefly touch on medications. Um, skipping medications is common during Ramadan. Uh, truth or false? True or false? Um, so yeah, it is actually very common. So a lot of patients have told me that you know they they'll just skip the medications and continue fasting as uh, as if they don't have diabetes. And that's very it's it's very dangerous because it will affect your blood sugar levels. It can affect um, you know, your, your ability to um, tolerate the foods that you're eating as well. So it's very important to have that conversation with your um, doctor about your medications and how to monitor uh, appropriately. Uh, next slide. So generally speaking, um, I won't get into too many specifics with the medications, but uh, generally um, the most commonly used medications like metformin, Genuvia, Jardians, these kind of medications are okay to continue with. Um, if you're taking insulin or if you're on medications that uh, increase your insulin, like dimicron or um, glycoside, glyburide, these may be needed. Uh, you may need to modify these medications. So just be mindful of that. Um, and like I said, for insulin, you need to make adjustments. So speak to your doctor about medications and what changes need to be made for Ramadan. Um, and I think our last slide, next slide. So in summary, uh, we know fasting in Ramadan is a religious obligation. Those with chronic illnesses are exempt, but again, for various reasons, people still want to fast if they have diabetes. Um, it's, it's truly a celebration. It's a, um, 
it's a community event. Um, well, not during COVID, but before, <laughs> and hopefully this year it will be. Um, and you know, meet with your family doctor, meet with your healthcare team uh, before Ramadan to make a plan to fast safely. Check in with them regularly as well um, if there's anything that's uh, going wrong. You know, learn about the different foods and how you can change your foods and alter your meals to fast safely. Talk about uh, fluids, medications, um, and again, the common complications that we talked about low blood sugar levels for hypoglycemia, high blood sugar level, hyperglycemia, uh, dehydration, uh, and weight gain. And meet with the registered dietitian with specialization in diabetes education um, and who's familiar with Ramadan. So I think that's all I have. Um, we'll yeah. open it up for any. Questions, any que anybody any might questions? Have. We have no questions yet in the chat, but I do have a poll. So I'm, I'm going to try to launch a poll just to get your feedback. And then we'll have time for questions as well. So here we go with the poll. And it's just a few quick questions that we're hoping you could take a minute to answer. Hopefully you all see the questions coming up on your, on your desktop there or your iPad or your cell phone, if you're on a cell phone. It might be harder to see if you're on a cell phone. We'll give people a couple more seconds. Oh, some of the questions are coming in. So, so I have a question um, in terms of meeting with patients uh, about Ramadan. So I think you mentioned we only have our week away, but I'm wondering, you know, in next year, when we think about this, how can we help make sure we reach out to patients uh, ahead of time so that they know to prepare? Because it changes every year, Ramadan, right? The month will move. And so we just maybe need to have that on our radar a couple months ahead of time to reach out to everyone. I think I think that's right. It's, it's just uh, being mindful. Um, I think a lot of patients don't know to ask or to bring it up um, because um, they just don't think, think about it. So hopefully people yeah. are asking more. Yeah, and, and I think there's so many questions that come up that really we can be helpful with. I have had a couple of people this week who really, um, you know, that has such a good discussion about really having that pre-dawn meal because many of them uh, were trying to see weight loss because they saw weight gain previously and, and that sort of really limiting to just one meal a day gets very tricky. Um, so we were talking about some of the options they could use for pre-dawn. So we do have, oh, we have a question. Does taking insulin injection break the fast? Uh, no, it does not. So you can still take insulin. Um, but I mean, you shouldn't be taking insulin during the fasting hours, right? So you should only be taking it really um, uh, at your mealtime, or uh, if you're on like a basal insulin like Lantis, um, or uh, one of the newer ones, you take that at a regular time. So you, ideally, you don't take it during uh, fasting hours, because again, you're going to make yourself uh, go low in terms of your blood sugar levels. Yeah, and that's where they want, would want to meet with their doctors like yourself for adjusting that to see what would be the right formula for each person because everyone's very different. So we have another question. My issue is I crave sweet stuff a lot. Do you have any suggestions to cr control it? Well, I think you're not alone there. We all do. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all do. We love, we love those things, right? They're energy and they taste great. And keep in mind, a lot of these foods are very special to us because we associate them with positive memories and family time. And, you know, they have a lot of meaning to us. And so it doesn't mean you have to completely exclude sweet things. That's where the testing is so helpful. It tells you what you're handling well and what might be tricky. And then that's when we can actually make adjustments. So as a dietitian, we teach people like budgeting strategies. So for example, if you want to have a sweet um, dessert, you might have, you know, a third of a cup of rice because you're making room in terms of the carb amount for the sweet coming um, from the dessert. And of course, that's fine to do once in a while. Hopefully we're not doing that all the time, but you know, there's ways to do that to manage it. So you can still enjoy those meals with family. You can still enjoy those foods together because again, they have a lot of meaning for people. And so we, there's lots of strategies we can use. There's also ways we modify recipes. Some people prefer to do that as well. We can modify some of those desserts so that they don't have as much impact on the post-meal blood sugars. Uh, so here's another question. Would putting sweet syrup, roux afsa, in milk decrease the blood sugar spike from this compared to just putting it in water? Oh, I see where you're coming from. So good thinking though, because milk has protein and you're thinking that might slow it down. Unfortunately, because it's still liquid, it still will raise the sugar, perhaps not as high as water with the sweet syrup, 
but it will still raise it because it's liquid. I would tend to, um, yeah, I would tend to put the sweet syrup in a food if you can, like if it's in a oatmeal, for example, that would be lovely, like in a nice cooked oatmeal, um, because the fiber from the oats will again, slow down how quickly that that food leaves the stomach. So you have a much slower, like release of the sugar, and less of a spike. So in a food would always be a better option for things like honey syrup, agave, whatever type of sweet syrup people are using. The other thing is, like with Ruefsa, you can, you know, just not make it as concentrated, because I know people mm -hmm. really pour it in and so uh, making it less concentrated. Uh, yeah. Or smaller, a, like or smaller or amount, yeah. Smaller. yeah. Yeah, and again, the testing will tell you because we're all very different. Some people can get away with a bit, no problem. Other people, it shoots their sugar right up, so. Yeah. Yeah, great questions. Any more questions at all? I don't see any more questions coming in. Was there any any last words you wanted to share, Dr. Lone? Um, no, I would just say um, for for future reference for people, I, I mean, I, like I said, it's only a week and a half away, but for future reference, uh, just keep it on your radar and to bring it up at your regular diabetic visits uh, before you go to um, go to your, uh, sorry, start fasting for Ramadan. Um, there is a question, is fruit salad okay to open the fast with? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean, it's really your personal choice, right? Um, and especially if you keep fruits in there that have edible skins, they digest slower. So things like berries, like blueberry, will give you a slower absorption of sugar. Uh, can you tell a good brand or kind of rice? Again, many kinds of rice. There's so many different variations of rice. So it's lovely to have so many options. Um, and it is really a question of your own personal preference, but you're trying to pick one that has more of the germ. So more of the fiber the, uh, on it, your um, like long grain converted rice, for example, um, absorbs relatively slow, more slowly than say a white sticky rice as, as an example. That glycemic index handout will give you more options there too. And I do suggest um, touching base with the dietitian in your doctor's office. They could definitely help you with other options there too. Does it make a difference if you drain the starch from the basmati rice? Slightly, again, just slightly. So again, this is where your testing will be uh, the best uh, tool for you to guide you whether you're, you're handling it well. Basmati is a very good choice, but again, everyone seems to be different in terms of how they respond and how, how, you know, how much they're having of the rice, how long it's cooked, et cetera. Lots of things to, to consider. So great questions. This has been lovely. So thank you all for joining us. We really do appreciate uh, you spending some time and, and uh, reaching out to us. And we encourage you to reach out to your teams um, and, and get further answers to any questions that you might have. Okay, so thank you everyone. Have a great afternoon. Bye-bye.